Hello, everybody. So I think we should get started so that uh, we can fit everything else into our schedule. Uh, my name is Asu Azdaglar. I'm a, a faculty member in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT. I'm also the Associate Director of IDSS, uh, as well as the Director of LIDS, Laboratory for Information and Decision Systems, which is one of the research labs that is within IDSS. Uh, it's an honor for me uh, to be moderating our next session on risk in financial systems and introduce our speaker. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to just uh, briefly make some remarks uh, about systemic risk uh, in financial systems. Uh, financial markets uh, manage, price, and redistribute risks. But they also create uh, other risks, in particular risks associated with financial crisis, as well as systemic, system-wide meltdowns in the process. The 2007-2008 uh, financial crisis, uh, which evolved into a global economic recession, has motivated much, much interest uh, in understanding how uh, these systemic financial risks are created and how they can be managed. And uh, uh, it's simplifying uh, to some degree. Uh, we can actually think about three broad perspectives on systemic risk. The first one, uh, which is very common in the popular press and also movies uh, like the big short, uh, emphasizes mainly the mistakes, biases, or myopia on the part of the participants in this market. And uh, in this view, of course, financial markets are inefficient and even dangerous. Uh, while there's no denying that uh, uh, my financial market participants, just like participants in any market, make many, many mistakes, this doesn't quite provide a satisfactory framework for explaining why several aspects of financial systems seem to be working well. And in fact, the US financial market grew without major crisis over several decades before the 2007-2008 crisis. The second perspective uh, focuses on how, this is a very system perspective, uh, consistent uh, with IDSS uh, objectives, focuses on how shocks to a few of the financial institutions can, under some circumstances, create domino effects and create systemic risk. And the emphasis here is uh, mainly how interconnections among financial institutions and even the market liquidity can be the creators of vulnerabilities in the system and create, uh, as a result, a uh, financial crisis. And uh, one interesting aspect of this viewpoint, which is, I think, uh, interesting from, uh, from the viewpoint of many in this audience, is that the creation of these large macro shocks, uh, macro effects from these micro shocks, actually leads to interesting nonlinearities and sometimes surprising effects. To illustrate this, I'd like to just quickly uh, give a very brief summary of some of the work I've done in this area, jointly with Darona Semoglu from MIT Economics Department and Ali Reza Tahbaz Saleh from Columbia Business School. And in this work, we basically considered a very simple, perhaps the simplest model of a financial network, in which each financial inst uh, institution has some assets and liabilities. And think about its assets, including claims on other institutions, and liabilities are just what it owes to other financial institutions. And given this setup, the equilibrium, financial equilibrium, is an allocation in which, given the realization of all other asset returns, each financial institution collects what is owed to him and makes requisite payments to other on its liabilities. So, so far so good, we can define an equilibrium this way, but the catch is that whenever one of these financial institutions is hit with a negative shock, it will not be, may not be able to make its full payments to all its creditors. And in this case, it may be forced to liquidate some of its, its long-term assets, which is inefficient. But even more interesting aspect is uh, when this institution cannot make its full payments, this will have impacts on the financial equilibrium. In particular, if another institution depended on what it was going to collect from this distressed institution to make its own payments, then we have a situation of a financial contagion. Now the shock from, has spread from the first institution to the second, and uh, it may go even further depending on the exact form of the financial network and the uh, size of the different liabilities of financial institutions. So what's interesting or informative or surprising about this setup? 
And mostly, uh, as a system theorist, it's basically that uh, it, it may lead to, this kind of interactions may lead to nonlinearities or the sometimes so-called phase transitions. And to understand this, I'd like to contrast two scenarios. Let's first consider the case when the shocks that these institutions are suffering are not too large. Okay? And in this case, we show that financial contagion can happen. And the best way of containing it is to create dense set of interconnections between all institutions. And in the jargon of network theory, the complete, complete network is the one that will be most stable in the face of shock. It will minimize systemic risk, whereas the ring or a cycle network in which each institution has only a single creditor will be the least stable one. And more generally, the more dense your network, the more stable it is because interconnections enable you to diversify risk among many other institutions. Now, what's interesting is if you consider larger shock, this, this story, which is also consistent with common wisdom, actually gets completely reversed. Complete network is the least stable configuration among all these institutions. And the reason is uh, interesting and informative. Basically, when you have larger shocks, it's hard to contain a single shock, and it will spread. And in this case, interconnections serve as a medium over which these shocks or failures will spread to the rest of the financial system. And complete network, having the most pathways through which this can happen, actually acts as a uh, medium in which this distress can invade the entire system. So this uh, quick exercise tells us about, sort of shows us the phase transition, shows us the dark side of interlinkages. If you're curious about what's the most stable network in this case, it's actually what we call a weakly connected uh, network in which we have several islands with dense interconnections that are weakly connected to each other. So this second perspective, this sort of shocks creating macro effect is very much an active area of research. There are many other more complex, sometimes empirically more relevant channels through which shock to one part of the system propagates to the rest. And this gives also a nuanced view on inefficiencies. Financial markets are not irrational, but inefficiencies are still there because of this contagion effect. What contagion means is what essentially what one financial institution does has implications for the entire system, which is not internalized. And there's a third perspective on systemic risk, which we're going to hear next. And this perspective basically starts from emphasizing the complex problems that financial markets are trying to solve and also highlights how these efforts actually lead to some peculiar, distinct features that we observe in financial markets. Basically, we learn that the huge volume of the transactions and the speed with which this takes place in modern money, money markets leads to or creates strong incentives for the participants to create opacity, opaqueness, and actually rely on information insensitive financial instruments. So not information rich, such as simple debt contracts or repo transactions, but then this, having this opaque environment opens the door for runs, panics, collapses, as we've observed in 2007 and 2008. So, you're in a treat, and uh, not bec only because this is a really uh, interesting and thought-provoking perspective, but you're going to hear about it from one of the maestros of uh, economic theory, Bengt Holmström. Uh, Bengt Holmström uh, needs no introduction, but I will still do my best to, to introduce him briefly. Uh, Bengt has uh, revolutionized, I think, not one, but several areas of economics. Uh, his earlier work uh, laid the foundations of modern theory of incentives, contracting an agency. He's the first uh, to provide a systematic analysis of delegation. His work over the past two decades focused on financial markets. Uh, his work in this area, joined with Jean Tirol, uh, became the workhorse model for the analysis of market liquidity and uh, shortages. Uh, Bengt Host Holmstrom is the Paul A. Samuelson Professor of Economics uh, at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was the head of the economics department from 2003 to 2006. He's an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Econometric Society, American Finance Association, an elected forum member of Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and Finnish Academy of Sciences and Letters. He served as the president of the Econometric Society in 2011. His influence and originality has been recognized by several prestigious awards, including honor, several honorary doctorate degrees, uh, as well as the inaugural Bank de France uh, Toulouse School of Economics Senior Prize, granted every two years for academic researchers who developed central concepts to improve our understanding of monetary economics and finance. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange, 
and MSRI joint price for innovative quantitative applications. And I would like to also read uh, the, uh, the information about this award because it's so fitting to the goals of IDSS, which recognizes an individual for originality and innovation in the use of mathematical, statistical, or computational methods for the study of behavior of markets and more broadly economics, as well as the distinguished Center for Economic Studies Fellow Award from the CECIFO Group Munich. He's a board mem member of Alto University, as well as a former board member of the Nokia Corporation. So with that, uh, please join me in delightfully welcoming Bengt Armstrong.